Wow, we have a really big turnout for the, the last, uh, last presentation of the day. I'm quite excited because um, I'm competing against beer, so like, that's always kind of a tough battle to face as a speaker here. Um, today, my, my presentation is called uh, Cloud in Your Cloud. It's basically how we use microservices to build DigitalOcean. Uh, we're one of the larger cloud providers, and I thought it would be really interesting to actually have a hands-on talk about somebody that actually uses microservices in production has been fairly successful at it at scale. I know there was a lot of great talks today and yesterday about like, how, how we can build microservices or what are microservices, but I think it would be cool to have a couple good examples of actual ones in production here. So cool, just really quick about me. Um, I have a book called Microservices in Go that's coming out in a couple months. I'm a technical lead at DigitalOcean, and I live in Bangkok. So I may have had the longest flight to get here compared to anybody else. <laughs> uh, but I am really enjoying the cold weather. I never really get to get a whole lot of that, so I'm quite excited. Um, so just really quick, just a background. How many people here know who what DigitalOcean does? Great, almost like the majority of the audience. But just for like the two people that don't, uh, we build a cloud for developers. Um, we, we focus on developer happiness, and everything we do in our cloud is about making developers happy. Uh, so our, obviously our internal tools, we want to be happy about what we build and like how we build applications. Um, so I kind of wanted to talk about like the different kind of applications that we have. Um, so you're probably saying, oh, well, is this going to be really applicable to me? If you guys are deploying an application to 10,000 nodes, is that really the same as like, my app that's running on like 20 nodes? And, and kind of how I wanted to break it out is that the product I work on, I work on the metrics product, is we have different kinds of vertical applications inside DigitalOcean. So we have a bunch of applications that maybe run on a dozen or two dozen nodes, which is kind of like the fairly typical example of most companies. You know, things like web front ends, API front ends, billing systems, community websites, these kind of run on very small numbers of nodes. But then we have a few applications that actually run across their entire fleet of hypervisors. So anything that has to do with VM scheduling, moving VMs around, uh, monitoring metrics of actual VMs or servers and hosts and these things. These, these applications actually have to run on tens of thousands of nodes. Um, and we're actually going to be launching a product here shortly that's going to be running on a million clones. So basically we have an agent that's going to be running on customers' virtual machines. So that's like the next level of scale. We're still kind of like a little bit worried about that one. But uh, that's, that's kind of the different scales of application. And I want to like Kind of my talk is going to go through how we build applications, like actually code them, uh, how we deploy them, how applications find each other through service discovery. And then I really wanted to dig into metrics. There was a really great metrics talk earlier, which it was great because there were some things that I'm not talking about and he wasn't talking about, so it's good. He didn't, I didn't get all my thunder stolen. Um, but I really love to do, dig into that. So cool, so this is the application I build. So from a customer's perspective, it's really simple. Like you're getting metrics about your VM. You're like, oh, well that's pretty mundane, right? Uh, it's really about you know, your, your pretty standard microservice app. You know, you have a couple microservices, there's a couple databases. It's about as, you know, it's pretty standard. Um, so we're gonna kind of walk through the life cycle of this application. And it's actually really interesting because this application has to have a component that gets installed onto 100,000 hypervisors. So like, it looks very simple here, but we'll get to actually see like, all the different portions of it. So let's start off with how we actually write code. Um, DigitalOcean, we use Ruby, Perl, and Go. Uh, vast majority of all of our new development is in Go. Uh, we have about 30 or 40 microservices currently written in Go. Is anybody here doing uh, actual production applications in Go? Okay, about 10, 15 people. Oh, that's good. That's actually a really good crowd. I, I've noticed that we've had like a really good diversity of different languages here at the conference, which is really kind of fun. I, I think the most controversial thing about we do about development is called the monorepo. Do people here know what a monorepo is? 
Okay, about half the audience. So um, I'll explain what that is. So basically, I don't know if Google invented this, but they certainly popularized it. It's basically you put your entire company's code into a single repo. And you're like, whoa, that's kind of crazy. Isn't that kind of against microservices and like against separation? But in my mind, the microservices are all about the separation at the network level or at the API level. It doesn't mean that pieces of source code across the, across the organization can't be shared. So for example, like one of the great things in our mono repo is if we want to change how we do logging, like we use, we use syslog or whatever, we can do it a single atomic commit across 30 or 40 microservices, and everybody, as soon as they do their next deployment, they'll get all those changes. And we don't have to go to 30 or 40 different groups. I open up one pull request, and I could potentially affect all of the microservices in the entire company. And so I, I think the, the mono repo is probably one of our biggest accelerants in development. Um, the only downside of mono repos is you have a lot more people that look at your code. So like we have 50 or 60, if you guys use GitHub, you end up having 50 or 60 people see every single pull request that comes into the repository, which can get like a little bit noisy. I think, I think GitHub doesn't really have great support for mono repos, and that's really kind of our main, that's kind of like the main drawback that we've actually had using a mono repo. And uh, this is definitely the best. Who, who here uh, practices pull request driven development? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. There's like a good portion of the audience. Yeah. So basically, everything, nothing ever gets committed into master in any of our repositories at DigitalOcean. Every single pull request has to have at least one other person committing on it. Uh, we even wrote a bot that checks the, the responses to the Git pull request and make sure that at least one other person has given it a plus one or a thumbs up or something like this. So that way, every single piece of code comes in, gets looked at. And I think the main reason we do this is because this is like how you get to continuous delivery. I know a lot of people at the conference talk about continuous delivery, and a lot of people are wondering how they get there. To me, this is the first step, because it basically means that every single thing that comes into your master branch has some level of quality around it. You have, you have somebody that verified that there was tests, that the tests ran correctly, and that it actually makes sense what you're doing. You have a teammate look at it. And basically what we do is every single time something gets merged into master, we actually build artifacts. So we build binaries of every single commit that comes into master. We may not deploy it, depending on the product. Some products we would do a continuous deployment, but some products we'll just post it and it'll be in a continuous delivery. So as soon as we're ready to upgrade it, we have a command that makes that, makes that binary available to all the systems. And I'll talk about that a little bit more during the deployment section. Um, and I think the other thing I, I think that's been really good about the way we're doing building is we've been trying, we've been slowly over time reducing the number of languages you use. So I think we're going to continue using Ruby for web stuff, but all of our microservices are moving from Perl in, into Go. And I know this is kind of controversial because there's been a couple talks about how like every group in your company should be able to use a different language, and that certainly can be nice. But it definitely limits you of, right now, pretty much we have 50 different people that can kind of jump in at any portion of our code base. And I, I think there's, a, there's definitely a big win to like limiting the number of languages. Maybe not go down to one, but maybe two or three might be uh, kind of a better approach. Uh, service discovery. This is probably one of my favorite areas. And I was surprised there wasn't like a full talk today about service discovery, so that was really good. Um, I'm curious here, um, maybe just a quick survey. Um, who's using like Zookeeper for service discovery? Okay, we got like four, oh, actually like 10 people. How about ETCD, anybody? Okay, two people, that's good, oh, four people. Eureka, a couple of people, all right. How about Console? Oh, hey, it's uh, interesting. Okay, there's about 12, 15 people. Uh, that might have even been the most. I'm surprised. And is anybody using something else that I didn't mention? Or? Do you, do you, ah, that's, the, that's actually the best kind of service discovery. We'll talk about why that is actually in a second. Um, so what's really cool is I really like console. Like, on my previous projects, we use ETCD and we use Zookeeper. We actually have a couple services in production that run on Zookeeper. But console is like, 
they actually, it was like the difference between like engineering your own engine or actually buying a car from the store. Because like you get console, it comes with a GUI, it actually knows about what services are, it knows about hosts, it has a key value database, it has ACLs. Uh, it's kind of like you open the box, you install it, and it has everything you would ever want for service discovery. Um, that's why I really, really, really recommend console, and it's, it's done really well for us, actually. Um, the other tools that just, you had to build, you had to do a lot of building blocks around the console. And you say, okay, so if we come back to that, that the picture before is we have a, a very simple architecture where we have like, this is actually for the architecture for a front-end web application here for the metrics. So we have like three different microservices, a couple MySQL databases, a couple HA proxies, right? This is probably like as standard of an architecture as you can get. But what's kind of interesting is every line between every part of the system actually uses console for discovery. So what happens is the HA proxy that's sitting on the internet, it doesn't know about these two radar APIs up here. It, it, it uses DNS through console to actually find the APIs. So the APIs don't know where MySQL is. They, they use DNS to find MySQL through console. And what's kind of really cool with console, and since you can use it as a, you can use DNS, is you can do things like we have bind actually be able to cache our entries in console. So if console ever went down, the system doesn't fall over or anything like that. So it becomes a very scalable solution. Um, and we even do that between microservices. So we have this microserver, microservice over here called Wharf, and it needs to interact with radar. And they don't know where each other are. We have like a growing or shrinking clusters of them, and it just finds it all through console. And, and what you might say is, okay, that's kind of cool. You're doing that with like three microservices, but can you really do that with 10,000 nodes or 100,000 nodes? And does that like actually scale to an entire data center? And that's actually something we wanted to find out. So about two months ago, after we had been running console for a little while, we were like, can we run this on all of our hypervisors? Was kind of our experiment. Um, so what's kind of different about console than some of the other solutions is console both has centralized servers that can replicate between regions, it also has like a gossip protocol. So, like, so that means that hypervisors sitting within the same rack, they can, actually, they can actually get service discovery cache data between each other without going to the console servers. So like we only have maybe like three or four VMs running console in each region, but we might have 10 or 20,000 servers, or in some regions maybe 50,000 physical servers that need to get service discovery information. And it, and it scales pretty well. Um, but one of the biggest problems we had, so it was funny when we were deploying this, is we started out with like 100 nodes. And we're like, ah, oh, this is cool. This works great at 100 nodes. So we throw it up to 1,000, and it still works great. We're like, ah, oh, is this really going to go to like 10,000? So we, we, we went, and we were like, crossed the fingers, and we went up to 10,000. And we started to notice that actually all of our load balancers were pegging the CPU at like 100%. And we're like, ah, oh, this is not going to work. We can't do this at 10,000. So what we, but we started to dig in, and what we found out was that like, Linux has like this really tiny ARP cache by default. It was like a couple hundred machines or something, and we have like thousands of machines. So literally, we just killed the load balancers by ARP requests. So we did like a small kernel tweak of like adding like larger ARP cache, and boom, we were able to like run the gossip protocol against like 10,000 hypervisors, like no problem. Which is really cool, and you're like, well, what's, what would be the advantage of being able to do this? Is So one of the biggest problems that I had when I first got to DigitalOcean doing the metrics product was we're a really fast-growing startup, so the ops team would go buy 1,000 servers and rack them. And then customer would complain, oh, I don't see metrics for my virtual machine. And I'll be like, well, nobody told me that we just bought 1,000 new servers, right? And like, oh, okay, okay, let me spin up more metrics. So now, every time they rack new machines, they automatically become into our service discovery, and the metric system can actually just find the new 1,000 machines and automatically be pulling in the metrics about all the virtual machines on those new, those new hosts without anybody coming to my desk and be like, oh, we got these new boxes. Do you need to set everything up? Uh, so that's kind of been one of the big wins. Um, the other really cool thing with console, 
and I'm, I'm like a big fan, so, um, is that it actually does multi-region replicas. So like each cluster in each region has the full data set for every region, and you can actually write to it from different regions, and it still interacts with each other. So, big fan. Um, this is a good one. So there was a guy in the back that said he uses DNS for all his uh, service discovery. And I would say that that's, DNS is probably the best way for doing service discovery. Um, because what you'll see is like with Zookeeper ETZD, you sometimes have to like change every single application in your system to be able to use service discovery. And that's really not feasible because you want to be able to use off-the-shelf products like HA Proxy or Nginx to be able to do load balancing. So that's where really DNS really shines. If your service discovery tool is putting DNS entries in, basically every single thing in the world works with it. Um, what's also cool is it still has an API. So if you want to do things like, um, for example, our HA proxy configs are generated from the H API. So if you want to do things like if the health of a node in the service discovery doesn't, is down, it removes it from the config file. It has like built-in support for doing stuff like that. Or if you want to put nodes into maintenance mode and stuff like this, you can do that all through an API. So you kind of have the best of both worlds. Because originally, we did all this with DNS and bind. But then like every time we wanted to change something, we'd have to go and update bind configs. And like we have our bind configs in like Git, so we'd have to do Git commits to do service discovery updates. But now we actually just have an API that we can actually be able to put nodes into maintenance mode or down servers that are kind of misbehaving. Cool. So deployment. This is kind of like one of my fun areas that I really love. Um, so we kind of have, I know a lot of people, uh, how many people are using like Docker, something like that, to deploy their amps? Oh, that's cool. Actually, a huge portion of the audience. Um, so we have some Docker. We, we're still like a bit behind on the actual Docker. But we kind of have our own Docker-like registry internally. We call it our artifact registry. And basically, every commit that goes into the repo, we build Go binaries. And then we tag them with like a branch and a version into our artifact repository. And it's kind of very similar to like if you tag the Docker repo or something like this. And what's kind of cool is um, we use Chef to do our deployments, which is kind of probably outdated. Everybody's like, why would you use Chef today? But it works really well for us because what's kind of cool is because we use Chef, we can like write, when we want to do like slow rollouts of our cluster, we can like write five lines of Chef code that says like, 1% of the nodes based on a hash of the host name get the new version or something like that to do like very slow rollouts. Because that's something um, I've seen a lot of the conference was things like blue green clusters or red black clusters. But that really can't work in our scenario because we're deploying stuff to a hypervisor and the hypervisor has customers on it. So like we don't get to have like double the number of hypervisors to like deploy our applications to because it, it doesn't make any sense. So like the only way we can do things safely is a lot of times is to do either very slow rollouts or we do things like feature flags. And hopefully everybody using feature flags nowadays? How many? Oh wow, only okay. A quarter of the audience. Okay. That's cool. So I'll just really talk about this briefly. Um, kind of give some background. So basically, feature flags are the idea is that every time you build a new feature in your application, you put like a flag system around it. So maybe either that flag doesn't run in production initially if it's still a very unstable feature. Or a lot of time, what we use feature flags for is we do beta customers. So like I'm building a new, I'm building a new metrics product. And all the APIs for it are a feature flag where only a very small number of our customers can ever see it. So like, that's, that's to me like one of the best ways. That's how we can actually do, we do deployments, uh, at least on my team, we do deployments maybe a couple times a day. Um, and across the company, we probably do 20 or 30 deployments a day across all of our services. It's so like the only way you can keep master up to date is to be able to be able to put things that are less stable into production, but maybe only a very small set, subset of the customers actually get to use it. Uh, and I, I already talked about the incremental rollout. All right, 
monitoring. This is actually like my favorite area. And there was a really great talk earlier too. So um, I, wa I wanna actually talk about some of the things that he didn't get to talk about. It's really good. Um, same as them. Um, how many people here are using Prometheus? Ah, okay, only eight. Okay, Graphite. Okay, same amount. Uh, InfluxDB. Okay. Oh, it's like it's really divided. What, what's another one? Is anybody using anything else other than those three? No. Okay. Yeah, those are those tend to be the popular ones. Um, What's really cool is, uh, I don't know if you missed it earlier, but basically Prometheus is uh, built by the SoundCloud guys. Uh, so they're here in Berlin. They're really cool guys. They've ca they came out to our office a couple times. Um, we're currently the largest installation of Prometheus now, I think, because we have over 10 or 20,000 nodes being monitored by Prometheus. But basically what's kind of different about Prometheus than other monitoring solutions, if you use Graphite or InfluxDB, it's, it's actually built by the guys that wrote the metric stuff at Google. And the way Google does things is, instead of pushing metrics to your system, it pulls. So every microservice and every machine exposes an HTTP endpoint with the actual metrics in it. So Prometheus goes and it scrapes the different microservices in a region. Well, what happens if you get too big for one Prometheus? Well, you spin up two or three and you just subdivide the number of machines to each of the Prometheuses. Uh, and what happens when you want to get aggregates across an entire region? Well, you have a Prometheus that scrapes other Prometheuses. <laughs> and what happens, um, we have a diagram here, and what happens when you want to find the aggregate across all eight of our regions? <laughs> in New York, we have uh, our special Prometheus cluster which goes and scrapes the Prometheus in all eight other regions that we have. So it kind of like turtles all the way up. So like, you can kind of get a really nice view. Not everybody's deploying code into eight regions, but I think there's a couple people here that were deploying in three or four regions. Um, what's nice is if you want to be able to get a kind of a global view of the health of all of your microservices and all of your machines, you can kind of get this one global view. And if you want to dig into a specific data center, you just go to the Prometheus server in that data center. Um, so this, this solution is really cool because it pretty much scales up infinitely. And if it doesn't scale, or if you put it on the machine that's too small, unlike the other database solutions, it basically just means you get less granularity because the machine, just by it being overloaded, will only be able to scrape maybe like twice a minute or once, or once, or once every two minutes or something like this. So you, don't, you never are missing stats, you're just kind of getting less granular if you put it on machines that are less powerful. So it's kind of been a really great, it's kind of been a great option for us. Um, of course, Grafana. I'm, I'm guessing that a huge portion of the audience uses Grafana. How many people? Okay, almost more than half of the audience. So anybody that's not using it, I have no idea why you would not use Grafana. It is absolutely the best. As if you take one thing away from the entire conference, you should just install this tomorrow. <laughs> but um, yeah, we use Grafana for all of our internal metrics, all of our internal dashboards. It's, it's really good. And what's kind of cool is we actually have it hooked into our console DNS service discovery. So it finds the Prometheus nodes via, via console. So like we don't ever even configure Grafana. <laughs> I like it. Um, cool. Uh, structured logging. Oh man, this is my... Is, um, I know I ask a lot of hand raising, so maybe your hand will be tired after this talk. But um, people here, who's doing structured logging? Like, that means that your logs are computer readable in some kind of either binary or JSON format. Or... Oh, wow, okay, good. Like 30% of the audience. So kind of basically the idea of structured logging is, is that you log stuff that can be reread re by a computer. Like historically, maybe that was binary, but now for the most part, that's just JSON. Um, and the reason why would you do this? Well, the thing is, is I heard, in, I heard one of the talks where somebody had 50 microservices in production. And my thought was, how do you actually, like, how do you actually like, manage or actually monitor 50 different microservices, right? Like, obviously, you have to have computers that like, actually analyze what the logs are doing and be able to do aggregates of logs and be able to do analytics of logs. So if you just have developers just like punching in random log messages, you're never going to be able to actually get correct information or you're never going to be able to get structured information out of your logs. Um, so basically, this is what kind of like a structured log looks like, is that 
you have like your traditional message, but then you also have all these other environments, like maybe the PID of the process, the log level, time, process names. And what's kind of cool is you can kind of put any kind of tag. So for example, we'll put like a username or a user ID with, so if somebody came to the site and they call us up and they say, oh, I can't create new servers, we can actually just search for their username in the logs, and we, should, we can actually get structured logs, and we can find every single log that's associated with that user, which is something that like, you haven't been able to do in the past. And the great thing about using JSON as the log is syslog and rsyslog. JSON is now the standard, standard, uh, is the standard format. So like, you don't need to install any special software. If you have Ubuntu, you have rsyslog, and you can just use structured logging. Um, and we pipe all of our logs into a tool called Kibana. And basically, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually come back to Kibana, but I want to just, I want to actually talk about how we manage logs. Is, so there's a, there was some talks, there was actually, I've talked to at least two or three people here who actually had so many logs that they couldn't actually get them into their Elasticsearch cluster in a reasonable fashion. So I, I thought I really wanted to talk about this. So basically, the architecture we've chosen is every microservice on the local machine will write to syslog. And then in every region, we use, an, we use a thing called an rsyslog aggregator. And basically, our syslog can actually aggregate logs in memory, and it can actually act as a funnel to the Elasticsearch that we have in New York. So we have like a giant, we have like a 50 node now, I think, Elasticsearch cluster in New York. And basically, each region, like our Frankfurt region or our Singapore regions, actually have local aggregators. And we just use our syslog. Uh, we don't have to have, I know a couple other people were mentioning like they have like giant Redis setups, and then like the Redis setups were falling over. But our syslog is really well meant for this. Um, and you can kind of scale them independently. And you can actually, they're kind of stateless. So you can spin up as many our syslog aggregators you need in a region to be able to get the kind of log scale that you want. And, um, I'm, there's, I'm really a big fan of aggregating all your logs into one region, because if you, otherwise you won't be able to find things. So like if you have, like us, we have eight different regions. If we were trying to search for logs on like eight different instances of Elasticsearch across all of our regions, we would never be able to find, we'd never be able to find any kind of logs. So I'll just talk really quickly about um, this tool, Kibana. So what's really cool about Kibana is if you've used like Logstash or if you use Graylog or you used um, Splunk or any of these tools, it has all the standard log searching. Um, but what's really cool, if it's going to, yeah. What's really cool is if you use structured logging, you can do things like you can actually search on fields. So like if you want to say like, oh, the type of the file is an Nginx access log or you can filter in dates and you can see like actual structured information. So like for example, we might dry up in an ID of a user or an ID of the host of the hypervisor that it's running on, these kinds of things. You can actually drill in and find all the information through your structured logs. I think this is really, really, really powerful thing. And what's also really cool is if your logs have structured data, you can actually build dashboards. So like, for example, we also drop in like latency times into our logs, and we can actually do things like we can build dashboards where we can show the latency of logs in our system, a latency of like HTTP requests or something like that. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about is uh, we're, just, we're just barely doing this, and I think this is really a, a really frontier topic, is basically distributed tracing. So the idea is, is that, like, let's say that we have microservices. We have microservices that call microservices that call microservices. Well, how do I actually know the flow? How do I know what, what, what interaction on a web page or a public-facing API that was associated with? So distributed tracing is basically about putting a transaction ID at the top level of each, of each API call. So like, say we have a public API call on the internet, we start a transaction ID. And every microservice below it has its own child transaction ID. And what's cool is if you actually do structured logging, 
you can log all this into your structured log. And if you want to find all the logs across like six different microservices that were called in a single request, you can actually aggregate them across a single transaction. Um, it's still really early. The only, the only tools that I've seen that are like, we're, we're doing it in mostly in Kibana right now, um, just through structured logs. The other tool that I've seen a bunch of other people use is Zipkin. It's from Twitter. But honestly, in my mind, it's really, really early software. Um, it's a lot of work to set up, and I, I didn't get as much value out of it. But I would really love to see some people build some tools around this space. I think we'll probably build some tools too. But I think this is really, to me, the most important thing for microservices to actually, for us to scale from 50 to 100 to 200 microservices, distributed tracing is going to be the only way we're going to get there. Um, Uh, and that's, that's about it. I wanted to leave some time for some questions. Um, open it up. Hi there. Um, I have a question about the, um, uh, the monorepo you mentioned. Um, do you keep, like you mentioned that you're basically maintaining Ruby, Perl, and Go. Um, do you maintain all these languages in a single monorepo? Or do you have them uh, separated in three monorepos, so to speak? Yeah, so that's a good question. And uh, the question is, do we put all the different languages in one monorepo or not? So, I would, so we don't. We, we do one monorepo per language. Uh, now, I've seen other companies, I think Google actually just does one monorepo. And I would argue that that's probably even better, is to just do one monorepo for all the languages. But that's, that's not somewhere we're at right now. Okay, and then maybe a uh, quick uh, uh, second question on that one. When you say you have, a, let's say, a Perl consumer and a, uh, and a Go server or provider, then how do you actually do uh, the entire testing then? I can imagine that once you make a change to... The repo or multiple repos, you want to test everything? Is there any test strategy that you have to like, <laughs> test across <laughs> implementations and this, languages? This is, this is the worst one, honestly. Um, so the question was, what happens if I have Go code that needs to talk to one of our Perl services? And this happens a lot because actually one of our most important services in the whole system is written in Perl. Um, so what I've done is every time I need to interact with the Perl system is I'll write a stub in Go that implements the interface so that way, when I write my integration test, I can understand like, that I'm using the correct interfaces that I would have had in Perl. I don't try to do things like spin up the Perl process. Um, maybe if we were a bit more sophisticated with our Docker setup, I've seen other people do, like, they'll spin up a Docker image of maybe their Perl server and then their Go server or something like that. Yeah, so it's also related to the monorepo structure. Uh, you mentioned that you're using a pull request based development. So, uh, do you do do you test the whole repo in each pull request? Yeah. Or, or, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was, do we test the entire repo on every pull request? And yes, because one one can like one change could affect a dozen services. And what's kind of cool is like if I want to make a change to one of my interfaces, I'll know if I broke another service that was consuming it. Okay, and I have another one that's uh, related to, to distributed tracing. Do you have a, a pattern or a kind of a, an API gateway where do you uh, start a transaction there? Or do you do, do, you do that through HA proxy? Or? So, so that's a great question. How do we actually do distributed tracing correctly? Uh, the way we're doing it is in our Go, we have, a, we have an HTTP client library. And everybody that wants to make HTTP calls or gRPC calls um, in Go has to use our library. And the first thing the library does is pass in the parent transaction ID. <laughs> and we just pass that around as an HTTP header down through the stack. Um, I've seen an, an agenda about the software networking. Could you software networking. Uh, I, I, saw, I have seen it in agenda. So could you so just... So, say that, I'm sorry, say that one more time? Uh, net, software net networking. Oh, software networking. Oh, yeah. So the, the question is, what are we doing with software networking? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and also, so one question about how uh, discovered services uh, and, uh, I mean, how organized security when you set up new, for example, cluster inside DigitalOcean. 
Okay, so there's, there's kind of two kind of related questions there. Is um, how do we do software-defined networking and how do we do um, clusters? So our public statement is we're, we're still pretty early on actually having a software-defined network for customers. We're going to be launching that later this year. I can't say the date. But we're basically using a package called Comtrails, which allows to do software-defined networks between virtual machines. Um, so like internally what we do is we actually have we'll have each cluster will have like a software defined network. So like we'll have like a DMZ between different APIs and stuff like that. Uh, that how long? Uh, is it an internal thing? Uh, we're going to be we're going to be offering a product, but later I, I I don't I'm not on that team, so I don't know the exact dates. But we're going to have a product later this year on that. On the security, the same thing. We, we, we use the software to find networks internally for our internal applications. We have a separate network for our internal applications. Just out of curiosity, um, here. Oh, OK, sorry. Um, having a monorepo, um, following back on his first question, how long does your build time take? So yeah, OK, so this is a good question, is how long does the build time take with the monorepo? And that's probably the biggest pain, is, uh, <laughs> is, is uh, the build time can be 20 minutes. So what we do is we have two different kinds of builds. So like, we'll have like a, we can have a quick build, and a quick build will just do your service. And we'll do that for like iterations if we're going to do it. And then before it goes into master, it actually runs the entire build. So it won't actually go into master without running the whole build. But you can still do your pull requests in a fairly good time. Just follow, another follow-up question. What build tool do you use? Um, so we use Drone. Uh, the reason we like Drone is basically because it uses containers. So like every build has like a fresh environment. Because when we had Jenkins, what would happen is like the environment would get into a strained state, and then stuff would just break. Yeah. Do you have any other ones? Oh, there is one in the back there. Uh, hi. Thanks for the talk. Uh, my question is about. Um, how do you manage configuration and uh, credentials and stuff like that? OK, that's a great question. How do we manage configuration and credentials? Um, so from a programming standpoint, every single microservice is not allowed to have configuration files. So all configuration is through environment variables. And the environment variables could either come from one of two places. Uh, for most of the applications, it's just in Chef. So if they're like not, if there's like no kind of sensitive credentials, uh, we use Chef for all that kind of configuration. Uh, for things that are sensitive, we're starting to use a product from HashiCorp. I think it's called Vault. I'm not really that deep into it, but we're starting to put all of our secrets into that. Yeah. Cool. Any other yeah, I have a question here about uh, Monoripo again. Uh, so. <laughs> So, controversial. <laughs> yes. So basically, you have uh, you said that your pull requests need one re review, right, for getting merged. Yep. And it's one repo with all the services. So someone can touch multiple services owned by different teams, or do you don't you don't you have like uh, no ownership, uh, or how does it work? Oh, that's a great question. How does ownership work in a mono repo? Um, so the way what we, what we do is we have an owner's file inside of each uh, microservice that's like the team that owns that microservice. And what we do is we have a, Git bot, a GitHub bot, which we should probably open source this thing. But basically, the GitHub bot looks and it says, depending on which directory you modified, it will look at the owners. And it will tag the owners into the pull request. So that means if other groups get tagged into your pull request, you need to get a plus one from the other groups also. Okay, we got another one. Uh, so you mentioned you're using Chef. Uh, are you using just a single Chef repo, or, or are you, do you have <laughs> different Chef environments, for example, for yeah, different yeah. teams, or how, how do you manage that? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. Um, do we have a Chef mono repo? And we do. So we have one Chef mono repo for the entire company. Um, it's probably the most painful part about working here. <laughs> Uh, but that, I think that's more of a chef problem. <laughs> we got any other ones? Maybe one not about mono repos. <laughs> cool, awesome. So let's get some beer and uh, feel free to grab me.